Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green. This is a contextualized reading for uh, Homer's Odyssey, book 16, Father and Son, as part of our course, Homer and the Critique of Western Civilization. Uh, so we left off at the end of book 15 with Telemachus uh, arriving back in um, Ithaca and going on to meet the swine herd. Um, he's been told to do so by Athena, who forewarned him of the plot of the suitors to overtake his ship um, on re-entry and kill him. Uh, and so, uh, as dawn came into the lodge, the king and the lawyer's loyal swine herd set out breakfast. Once they'd raked up the fire and got the herdsmen off with droves of pigs, and now Telemachus the howling dogs went nuzzling up around him, not as a not a growl as he approached. Um, from inside, Odysseus noticed a pack the pack's quiet welcome, noticed the light tread of footsteps too, and so he's seeing his son for the first time. But we get this um, uh, comparison to his own entry, where the dogs didn't recognize him. Right, that's going to be a theme that's coming up dogs and the ways they recognize people. You may as here comes a friend of yours, I'd say, sh someone you know at least. The pack's not barking, must be a fawning all around him. Um, uh, I can hear his footfall. Um, the words are still on his lips when his own stu son stood in the doorway and the swineherd starts, um, s uh, started up and goes and hugs him and kisses him. And we get this really great simile, I think, from the poet Homer here, um, uh, because we know that we this is Odysseus looking at his own son. Um, and the poet says, as a father brimming with love welcomes home his darling only son in a warm embrace, what pain he's born for him and him alone, home now in the 10th year, Far, from far abroad, so the loyal swineherd hugged the beaming prince. He clung for dear life, covering him with kisses. Yes, like one escaped from death. Nice, really, really nice doubling, I think, by the by the poet here. Um, uh, and, and we see through that doubling a kind of close kinship between the character of Odysseus and the swineherd here. Um, which we've kind of learned in the earlier chapter that they're almost uh, like brothers, or at least um, uh, now this is not to sort of like pacify the fact that uh, um, Eumaeus is clearly a servant and swineherd, um, but he is raised with Odysseus's older sister, right? Um, so there, there's there's a closeness that's being emphasized. Um, uh, uh, by the text itself and so that, that human warmth can exist between people even amidst regimes of oppression right um uh your home telemachus his um sweet light of my eyes i never thought i'd see you again once you ship to pylos quick dear boy come in let me look at you look to my heart's content under my own roof the rover home at last you rarely visit the farm and men these days always keeping to town as if it cheered you to see them there that infernal crowd of suitors have it your way, dear old man, says Telemachus. It's all for you that I've come to see you myself and to learn the news, whether my mother still holds out in the halls or some other man has married her at last in Odysseus's bed, I suppose, is lying empty, blanketed now with filthy cobwebs. Uh, surely she's still waiting for you in the halls, says um, Eumaeus. With that, he took the bronze spear from the boy and Telemachus crossing the threshold um, went inside, and as he approached, his father go, went, goes to rise, and we see Telemachus saying, You stay where you are, stranger. I know we can find another seat somewhere here on our farm, and here's the man to fetch it. Then um, Telemachus asks Eumaeus about the stranger. Um, uh, they reached for the good things that lay at hand, and when they would put aside their desire for food and drink, Telemachus asks his loyal serving man, 
old friend, where does this stranger come from? So notice that there's a little bit of respect going on for Eumaeus' household as well. Um, uh, that uh, Telemachus um, asks Eumaeus um, what is happening. Now he's also, you know, the lord and master and sort of knows that he owns the, even the, the household that the swineherd is on. Um, but there is at least the decorum here of uh, Xenia showing up. Uh, and then Eumaeus says, uh, um, oh yeah, it retells the story of, um, uh, uh, the false story, of course, that Odysseus says about being from Crete. Um, and then he says, I can't let him go down and join the suitors. They're far too abusive, reckless, no, no limits. They'll make a mockery of him. That would break my heart. And so there's a kind of duty that Eumaeus has to even this beggar. Um, and Telemachus agrees um, uh, 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 as well. And Odysseus breaks in and says, friend, surely it's right for me to say a word at this point. Um, my heart by God is torn to pieces hearing this, both of you telling how these reckless suitors there in your own house against your will plot your ruin. A fine young prince like you. Tell me though, do you, do you let yourself be so abused or do people around you stirred up by the prompting of some God despise you? Or are your brothers at fault? Brothers a man can trust to fight beside him true, no matter what deadly bl blood feud rages on. Would I were young as you to match my spirit now, or I were the son of great Odysseus, the, or the king himself ruined, returned from his ro all his roving, there's still room for hope. Then let some foreigner lop my head off if I failed to march right into Odysseus's royal halls and kill them all. So this is, of course, the canny um, Odysseus who um, uh, says, if I were the king himself. But he's also, in all of this performance that he's giving, he's showing his allegiance and um, uh, how he would stand in support of the laws of Xenia to do the just thing when it comes to strangers and to be treated justly. He's teaching others how to treat him as a stranger. Um, and uh, Telemachus then tells Odysseus of his struggles, the struggles with the suitors. Um, so Odysseus is getting intelligence here from uh, uh, his son about the situation. And then Telemachus sends Eumaeus to tell Penelope that he's returned safely. Uh, again, Athena has already told him to do this. Um, and uh, we know that Penelope is worried, um, sick to death over, um, with worry over Telemachus. Um, uh, um, and then we get again this kind of second person familiarity that the poet gives to Eumaeus. I know you assured your prince Eumaeus, loyal swineherd, um, quote, I see your point. There's sense in this old head. One thing more and make your orders clear. On the same trip, do I go and give the news to King Laertes too? Telemachus says, don't go tell Laertes, the old man. Then after he leaves, Athena appears directly to Odysseus and tells him, now is the time to reveal yourself truly to your son, Telemachus. Um, and she appears in this way um, at first, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, not at first, sorry, excuse me. She, she approaches as, as a tall woman. Um, uh, beautiful and tall, skilled at weaving lovely things. Um, uh, so Eumaeus has just has run out, um, uh, and then but only Odysseus sees Athena as um, as this woman. Um, so he's like off. Uh, she's like off in the distance, and this this pulls Odysseus out of the house, and they um, she tells him, um, and then. Uh, um, uh, Athena in that moment then transforms Odysseus, right? So now that the swineherd is gone, Athena stroked him with her golden wand. 
First she made the cloak and shirt on his body fresh and clean, then made him taller, supple, young. His ruddy tan came back to him. Uh, uh, the cut of the jawline burned. So notice the aesthetics of beauty here. The tanness is part of the beauty. We'll see later on that Penelope, the women, um, are uh, given um, uh, an aesthetics of of kind of ivory white skin because she's a noble woman and she's been inside and so she's not in the sun. But the men here are aestheticized as being brown. Um, of course, I've already said some things in, in a passing and in an in-depth lecture on race and the ancient world and knowing that skin color racism um, is not the way that power and racist oppression worked back then. Doesn't mean it didn't exist, it just transforms over time. That kind of skin color based racism, as I've said in detail in other places, is the product of the past 500 years or so. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, her work complete, she went away, Athena went away, and Odysseus returned into the lodge. His own son gazed at him, and there's this wonderstruck terrified too turning his eyes away suddenly um and he think he mistakes odysseus for a god he says you must be a god um uh, your clothes they've changed even your skin has changed surely you are some god who rules the vaulting skies and odysseus is quick to say i am not a god right um that's the theme always um uh um, and he says, why confuse me with one who never dies? No, I'm your father, the Odysseus. You wept for all these days. You bore a world of pain. At first, Telemachus rejects him. He says, this can't be. Um, so again, that's that theme of disbelief. Um, and then it's countered um, uh, um, by Odysseus. Um, and he says, my changing so, this is Athena's work the fighter's queen. She has that power. She makes me me uh, look at, as she likes, now like a beggar, the next moment like a young man, decked out in handsome clothes about my body. It's light work for the gods who rule the skies to exalt a mortal man or bring him low. It's a nice, nice line, like high and low. We do not get to decide as humans, right? Um, the gods decide. Uh, at that uh, Odysseus sat down again and Telemachus threw his arms around his great father, sobbing uncontrollably. Um, they cried out shrilling cries, pulsing sharper than birds of prey, eagles, vultures, and ho hooked claws. When farmers plundered their nest of young, too young to fly. What a great image that is. They cry like birds who are losing their children, their young, their younglings, because um, uh, the farmers have come and wrecked their nests. Um, so both men filled with compassion, eyes streaming tears, um, uh, that now the sunlight would have set upon their cries if Telemachus had not asked his father all at once, what sort of ship, dear father, brought you here? It, um, Ithaca, at last, who did the sailors say they are. I hardly think you came back on home on foot. And Odysseus tells him about the Phaeacians, right, and how he got back home. Then he asks Telemachus for details on the suitors. He wants to get a tally on how many there are, and we see that he's already planning his revenge. Uh, and Telemachus, and he says, we're going to fight them, me, me and you. And Telemachus can't believe him. Father, all you've said that, like, just two of us, how it, it dumbfounds me, like, um, how on earth could two men fight so many so strong? These suitors are not just 10 or 20. They're far more. And he lists them. Uh, so 52 of them from um, um, Dulichion, um, uh uh, picked young men, six servants in their group, um, 24 men from Same, 20 from uh, Zacynthus, sorry, um, Achaeans, noble all, and 12 best lords from Ithaca itself. So a lot of men, right? Um, and Odysseus counters Telemachus's um, feeling that they, they, they could never win by saying, well, what if we had two gods on our side, right? What if Zeus and Athena were fighting with us? Do you think that we would still win? Um, uh, 
and Telemachus says shrewdly, um, two great champions, those you name, it's true, off in the clouds they sit, and they lord over gods and mortal men. And so Odysseus says, trust me, they won't hold off long from the cries and the clash of battle, not when we and the suitors put our fighting uh, strength to proof in my own halls. But now with daybreak home, um, home you go and mix with that overbearing crowd. The swine hurt will lead me into that city looking like an old broken beggar once again. And so Odysseus is quite sure of himself, right? That uh, Odysseus has the support of Athena and Zeus. Um, and he gives uh, Telemachus advice um, uh, uh, that he's gotten from Athena. When Athena, queen of tactics, tells me it's time, I'll give you a nod. And when you catch that signal, round up all the deadly weapons in the hall. Um, and so he tells them to remove all but just a couple of spears for themselves. And if somebody says, why are you taking all of our weapons? Um, uh, Telemachus is supposed to tell the suitors, um, well, I'm just storing them away from safekeeping because, you know, things get kind of rowdy. We get drunk in the halls and we don't want to fight. I don't want to fight breaking out in my own um, palace. Um, and so Odysseus says, just leave it you leave a pair of swords for the two of us, a pair of sphere, spears and a pair of oxide bucklers right at hand so that we can break for the weapons, um, uh, seize them. Then Athena, Zeus in his wisdom, um, they will daze the suitor's wits. Now, one last thing, bear in it in mind, you must. If you are my own true son, born of my blood, let no one hear that Odysseus has come home total secret. Don't let Laertes know, not Eumaeus either, none in the household, not Penelope herself. You and I alone will assess the women's mood, and we might test a few of the serving women, men as well. Where are the ones who still respect us both, who hold us in awe, and who shirk their duties, citing you because, slighting you because you are so young? Um, uh, and then he does say he wants, um, uh, or Telemachus says, um, I advise you to sound out the women as well, figure out who's disloyal to you, who are guiltless. The men, I say no to, no to testing them farm by farm. Um, that's work for later. If you really have really seen a sign from Zeus, whose shield is storm and thunder. Um, so they're plotting all of this out, what to do first, um, uh, um, who, uh, how to figure out who's been loyal later on. Um, Eumaeus then uh, reaches uh, um, uh, Odysseus's palace and he gives word to uh, Penelope, your beloved son, my queen, is home at last, Eumaeus, through uh, though bending close to Penelope whispered every word. Um, so this is a secret as well. Message told in full, he left the halls and precincts heading for his pigs. Um, but the news gets out to the suitors that Telemachus has returned, right? Um, so we know that the walls have ears, as we say, in the palace. The suitors are disturbed and they go off to decide what to do and they gather up. So rising all troops went down to the water's edge as the crew hauled the vessel onto dry land. This is the crew that was supposed to um, kill Telemachus uh, and the hot blooded hands bore off their gear. Then in a pack, they went to the meeting grounds, suffering no one else, young or old, to sit among them. Um, Eupithy's son Antinous rose and harangued them all, and he berates them uh, and says, What a blow! See how the gods have saved this boy from bloody death and our lookouts all day long. And then he hatches a new plot, right? So he says, the clever little schemer, he does have his skills, and the crowds no longer show us favor, not at all. So act before he can gather his people in assembly. He'll never give in an inch. I know he'll rise and rage away, shouting out to them how 
all how we, we schemed his sudden death, but never caught him. Hearing of our foul, foul play, they'll hardly sing our praises. Why, they might do us damage, run us off our lands, drive us abroad to hunt for a stranger's shores. Strike first, I say, and kill him, clear out of town in the fields or the road. Then we'll seize his estates and worldly goods, carve them up between us, share and share alike. But as far for his palace, let his mother keep it, she and the man she weds. So we see this much broader scope of, of, of politics showing up in the suitors' um, designs for the land. They know they've done something wrong. Uh, in hatching a plan to murder Telemachus. And if word spreads out, they're all in danger for this coup that they have uh, planned. Um, they're all in it together. Now, um, Amphimus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Amphinamus uh, disagrees with um, Antinous here and says, that killing Telemachus would be a bad idea, be at least unless the gods decreed it. And so there is this questioning of how far one can overstep themselves, knowing that they've overstepped quite a bit already, um, uh, and says, no, we shouldn't kill Telemachus unless the gods decree it. And this cold sway over most of the suitors here. Uh, but then um, uh, we get a shift, a narrative shift back over to Penelope. Uh, an inspiration took the discreet Penelope to face her suitors, brutal, reckless men. The queen had heard all how they plotted inside the house to kill her own son. And so it's going both ways, right? Like uh, there are spies in her rooms and she has spies that have um, figured out the plans of the suitors. Um, she knew that they were going to try and kill Telemachus, but now she knows that Telemachus is okay. So she confronts the suitors and rebukes Antinous, and notice that she rebukes him for breaking Xenia, for breaking that code of hospitality. You, Antinous, violent, vicious, scheming, you, they say, are the best man your age in Ithaca, best for eloquence, counsel. You're nothing of the sort, madmen, Madman, why do you weave destruction for Telemachus? Show no pity for those who need it. Those over whom almighty Zeus stands guard. This is that invocation of Zeus because of the law of hospitality, right? It's wrong, unholy, yes, weaving death for those who deserve your mercy. Don't you know how your father fled here once? A fugitive terrified of the people up in arms against him because he joined some Taphian pirates. So these Taphian pirates are showing up a number of times here. Out to attack um, uh, uh, Threspatians, sworn allies of ours. The mobs were set to destroy him, rip his life out, devour his vast wealth to their heart's content, but Odysseus held them back. He kept their fury down. And this is the man whose house you waste, scot-free, whose wife you court, whose son you mean to kill. You make my life an agony. Stop, I tell you. Stop all this and make the rest stop too. And so, again, what we're seeing is that this isn't just a battle with the suitors, right? There are much longer stories of alliances with and Taphian pirates, different alliances with um uh, um, the Aegeans or the Greek people, um, or the, at least the people from Ithaca here. Um, and uh, those alliances are breaking down because Odysseus is partly because Odysseus has been gone so long. Um, uh, and so as the alliances break down, then the more potential for violence arises and for people not remembering um, their commitments to one another. Uh, and then Eurymachus breaks in, and remember, we've heard that he's the best. He's the smoothest talker among the suitors. And he breaks in, praises Penelope, but tries to console her um, uh, and says, you know, this is well said, but don't let anyone, uh, I will honor Odysseus, right? My spear since the time, and again, Odysseus dandled me on his knees. 
Uh, the great writer of cities fed me roasted meat and held the red wine to my lips so to me your son is the dearest man alive and so we can see he's stepping in and he's saying oh yes yes this um uh the horrible idea to kill telemachus but just trust me and i'll keep telemachus alive nice try um by yuri Marcus. um uh, encouraging all the way, but what the uh, Homer tells us, encouraging all the way, but all the while plotting the prince's murder in his mind. The queen, going up to her lofty well room, fell to weeping for Odysseus, her beloved husband, till watchful Athena seals her eyes with welcome sleep. Then Eumaeus is returning um, back um, home, uh, and. Um, uh, Athena has changed Odysseus back into rags into looking like an old man and uh, Eumaeus um, uh, can't recognize him uh, then Telemachus says to the swineherd welcome home my friend what's the talk in town are the swaggering suitors back from the ambush yet or still waiting to catch me home, coming home uh, and Eumaeus says, I had no time to go roaming all through town, digging round for that. My heart raced me on to get my message and told and rushed back here. But I met up with a fast runner there sent by your crew, a herald first to tell your mother all the news. Um, and this I know I saw with my own eyes. I was just above the city heading home, clamoring over Hermes Ridge when I caught sight of a trim ship pulling into harbor loaded down with a crowd aboard her shields and two-edged spears i think they're your men after you're after i'm sure um at that the young prince telemachus smiled glancing toward his father avoiding eumaeus's eyes and now with the roasting done the meal set out they ate well and no one's hunger lacked for a proper share of supper when they put aside their desire for food and drink they remembered bed and took the gift of sleep. So Telemachus' possessions from that he's gotten his gifts um, from Menelaus and from Nestor um, and from Helen um, are going to be preserved um, because the suitors um, uh, have kind of been caught in the act of plotting Telemachus' death actively. That takes us to the end of book 16. And we will pick up again in uh, book uh, uh, in another contextualized reading for book 17. Uh, please support us on Patreon if you can. Uh, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever and whenever you are.